All right. Thank you. This is going to be a fast, um, a fast overview of Bible translation and missions. And, in the, and uh, my goal actually here, uh, some of you have seen some of these slides, have heard me talk before, but there are quite a few of you that haven't. And so the missions committee thought it would be good to go over this again and try to get exposure to more people in the congregation on what the ministry of uh, Chaba and Lisa and the Bakwe mission is all about. So I'll be setting um, some foundational, giving you some foundational information all over again. For some of you who have seen it before, um, you're going to see it again. I'm adding something new. I have three goals for my talk this afternoon. My first goal is to show you how strategic Bible translation is in world missions. And my second goal is to give you an example of what it looks like by showing you what we have been doing with the Bakwe um, people in Côte d'Ivoire. Third, my third goal is to be used by God to speak to those whom God is calling to be involved in Bible translation, whether in supporting it in various ways or becoming a translator yourself. So let's get started. First, let's look at uh, the importance of language the language we use to communicate the gospel. In Genesis 1.8, we read, uh, God gives us the cultural mandate early on in the history of man. He says, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so if you remember your Bible history, think back into Genesis there. We have then following in chapter 3 of Genesis, the fall of man. God kicks Adam and Eve out of the garden. They, uh, they sinned. They begin multiplying on the face of the earth, and so did evil multiply on the face of the earth. And the wickedness, and God sees the wickedness and decides to destroy all flesh. But he saves Noah, his family, and some animals. And then after making a covenant with man in Genesis chapter 9-1, we see the cultural mandate reiterated. So God blessed Noah in Genesis 9-1. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So we see it again. And a little later, in chapter 11, verse 4 of Genesis, we read, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole world. Instead of being fruitful and multiplying and going out, they end up saying, let's all gather in one place. Let's, uh, let's not do that. Let's make a name for ourselves instead of making a name for God. So instead of obeying God... Like I just said, they, they come together and they build the Tower of Babel. And this is a, um, Peter Bruegel, the, the elder's famous painting of the Tower of Babel. And you remember how in Genesis 11, 7 through 9, God says, Come and let us go down there and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. In one moment, mankind went from unity and communication to linguistic and cultural fragmentation. And of course, when God does anything, he always does it very, very well. So we're talking not about languages with grunts and groans, but languages with detailed and intricate sound systems, languages with complex grammars. Um, And then we come to Pentecost. Now, I'm jumping way ahead, but I want, to see, I want you to see something here in, in a reversal of Babel, that how the, the New Testament church and God's, in God's plan was a reversal of what happened at Babel. So later on in the New Testament, we see a, this reversal happening at, at Pentecost. God equips his people with the Holy Spirit to go out and finally with the ability to fulfill the cultural mandate given back in the Old Testament, given many different times, to go out under Christ's authority, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to be fruitful, and to make a name for God. All authority has been given to me, Jesus said, on his, this is the day prior to his ascension. 
And some days before Pentecost, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. But before going out into the world, Jesus tells his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the, of the Father, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, we read that they were gathered in one place. Does that sound familiar? They are gathering in one place um, instead of going out and being fruitful and multiplying. But they're gathered in one place with one accord. And in one place, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, then the Holy Spirit comes down. And in verse 4, we read, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And in verse 5, And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And this wasn't one tongue that everybody heard in their own language through a filter, but it was tongues, languages that they were speaking, and everybody heard their language being spoken by the apostles, by one of the apostles at least. Verse 7, And they were all amazed, marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not these all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear an each in our own language in which we were born? Each in our own language in which we were born makes it clear that the apostles were speaking the languages of the Gentiles. Notice that God does not impose a monotonous global language upon those who bring, he brings his word to. He doesn't standardize their cultures. Rather, he communicates to each one in the language in which they were born. The reversal of Babel is not globalization and standardization of language. Rather, it's God speaking in the languages of men. This is significant, I believe. This shows us that people's linguistic and ethnic identity is no longer a barrier to unity. People can only be unified and live in harmony in Christ. Rather than standardization of language, God's word is is able to transcend language and culture and unify the many into one. Bible translation must always precede, accompany, follow evangelism and church planting. In order for the church to effectively obey the Great Commission, the part that says in the Great Commission, teaching them all things that I have commanded you, that part, in order to obey that, the Bible must be translated into the language of the people to whom it comes. The scriptures are absolutely essential for the building up of faith of new believers to produce strong, self-reliant churches. And for this purpose, it's critical that the people have a Bible that they can understand by themselves. It's clear from history, if you look at history, that where the missionary effort of the church took the pains to translate the scriptures into the local language, the church had a greater success in planting the church and impacting a nation. One of our colleagues in, in Ivory Coast that we, uh, we worked with, Harriet Hill, has gone on to serve international, Wycliffe International, and uh, she, said, she has said uh, and published that although church growth is influenced by a variety of factors, times of increased emphasis on mother tongue scriptures, such as the time of the Reformation, often correlate with times of church growth. And likewise, times when the mother tongue scriptures were neglected in the communication of the gospel, such as during the early Middle Ages in Europe, these these times often correlated with times of spiritual stagnation. Also, churches that experience persecution and isolation from the rest of the Christian world have often endured and multiplied if they had the scriptures available to them in the local language. For example, Madagascar and China are two examples where the church thrived after missionaries were kicked out and they had the scriptures so they could feed themselves. The church, God, God could use the word to, to grow them up. 
In contrast, churches without the scripture in local languages, even those at the centers of Christianity, like, for example, in Alexandria, they have disappeared from the face of the map, from the, from the map. We know about Constantine and the Christianization of the Roman Empire from history, and it was significant, but it was all done in Latin and eventually hindered the reaching of lands outside the influence of the Roman Empire. This is a good, um, there is a good example from, uh, in history of the pre-Reformation church, where the church communicated the gospel faithfully in the language of the people that they went to. The Celtic church in Ireland is, a, is an example of a successful early mission er effort. In, his, um, in Philip Johnston's uh, article, an article that uh, I came across, he writes, what a debt we owe to the Celtic church for commitment to radical discipleship, love of nature, desire for learning, poetry, music, hymnody, and vision for missions that was not entirely lost over the centuries. St. Patrick, the great apostle of Ireland, had this understanding. He learned the hard way as a captured Celtic British slave of an Irish chieftain. He learned the language and culture from the bottom up. After escaping from slavery, he later returned to evangelize the Irish in Gaelic, not in Latin. Christianity and the mind of Christ sunk into the soil of Ireland, transforming more than just hearts. In several generations, Ireland became largely Christian and started sending missionaries to the Gaels and the Picts of Scotland, then the Angles and the Saxons of Britain. And they went on to send missionaries to France, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, northern Italy, and even Poland, and some think possibly Ukraine. I'm still quoting. Even as far as Iceland, much of northern and central Europe was first evangelized by the Celts and their spiritual descendants. What did they do right? They did many things right. But one of the key things worth mentioning here is that they ministered in the local languages so that the gospel was indigenized. In other words, it sunk into the soil. People um, were communicated the word in their own, in their own language. Celtic missionaries, it's, uh, history shows us, used a total of about 16 different languages. Here's a, a graph, interesting graph, of the, pros, the progress of translation. Let's look at the, the, the progress here. The graph starts in the 20th century, after the Reformation, and into the great missionary era. Bible translation picked up pace, and by 1900, there were 500 languages with some scripture. The pace of translation is accelerating every year, and this, these graphs come out of an article that Harriet Hill wrote. Between the years 1900 and 1960, the average number of Bible translations being started was 11.4 per year. In the 40 years um, from 1960 to 2000, the average rose to 26.2 languages being entered and started. And in the period from 2001 to 2004, the average rose to 64 languages per year. At the current rate, if young people like you join the work or others, it's possible that in our lifetime, a Bible translation will have started in every language in the world that needs it. So the next question you ask is, so how many languages are left to go? Well, the need is, is still huge. Most people don't realize how many languages are still live and well spoken in the world. There are six, over 6,800 languages being spoken in the world today, according to the current count. And out of these, 518 have the entire Bible. 1,275 have the New Testament and some portions of the Old Testament. 1,005 languages have portions only, either portions of the Old Testament or portions of the New Testament. Over 2,075 have translations in progress right now, currently. And about 1,500 of these uh, translations that are in progress are, are working, are languages that where Wycliffe works with its partners. About 538 of these languages are, are being worked in by other, other churches, other mission organizations, other agencies. But that leaves, if you do the math, 2,007 languages that have no translation begun yet 
at all. But the pace is picking up, and the church is not limited to the Western church. So there are many other churches across the, the world today where qualified men and, and women are joining the translation work. They're being trained, and they're entering the work of Bible translation around the world. So it's very feasible by the year 2025, which is one of Wycliffe's goals, it's feasible to have every language that needs it, those 2007 still, still left to go, having those begun by 2025. Wycliffe estimates that nearly 3,000 people are still needed to be translators, literacy specialists, trainers, computer specialists, accountants, teachers, and work in other support roles, uh, roles like teaching uh, missionary kids overseas and uh, pilots flying uh, supplies in and out of remote areas. All this, is, all this is needed in order to carry on the work of Bible translation. Wycliffe's mission statement is to assist the church in making disciples of all nations through Bible translation. Wycliffe believes that their job, their, their role, and their is to really do the translation job well and be able to train in translation. The churches have the job of, of of uh, planting churches and discipling the nations. But you can't do it effectively without the scriptures in the mother tongue. So we need men and women today, right now, willing to go, willing to leave father and mother, willing to leave another culture to learn another language, to raise their children in another land, willing to leave some comforts behind, willing to make enormous sacrifices to bring God's word to all nations, tribes, and people, to help the church worldwide disciple the nations. As I see it, there are three most important, I think, three roles for West, the Western missionaries in this age. The first is to help translate the scriptures. The, 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 we have a great heritage of being exact in the West. We have some, a lot of uh, 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 Christian baggage and, and then cultural shaping that's happened many, over many years. And uh, being exact, being faithful, being really uh, keyed in on details is something that the West is good at. It's not something that the Southern Church is generally good at. But working together in interdependence, we can work together and help translate the scriptures. The second thing um, I think that missions are, are needed for in missions today is more planting of churches. So church planting. And the third thing I would say is theological training of pastors and evangelists. Um, there, the church is expanding like grass fire, like a grass fire in the southern hemisphere and south of the Sahara, in, the, in Asia, in the Middle East. All over the world it's expanding and in many places education is very low. So pastors have very little education and, li and very little access to materials. And this is why it's important what Francis and Donna are doing with uh, Third Mill and getting materials into uh, a language of larger communication where pastors can use some of the resources that we all can use here. So theological training will be one area where, um, where missionaries are still needed today. So translating the scriptures, church planting, and equipping, equipping pastors and evangelists. So let's talk about Africa specifically and then our ministry, and I'll run through this pretty fast but I think we have the time. Wycliffe, this comes from the Wycliffe Global Alliance website. You've probably have seen this uh, elsewhere, but if you take, this is how big Africa is. Some of us, is, you don't realize it, but you can fit the United States in Africa, China, um, all of Europe in Africa. You can fit um, uh, Japan, some parts of Asia there as well. I mean, it's incredible. Africa is a huge continent. Africa has a rich heritage in the word and in the translation of the word as well. The Old Testament was translated from Hebrew to Greek in Egypt between the 3rd and 1st centuries BC. The Septuagint, right? By the 3rd and 4th centuries AD, there were, there were complete Bible translations in both the Coptic language of Egypt and Ge'ez, Ge'ez I think is how you pronounce it, of Ethiopia. Complete translations by the 4th century. The Coptic, Ethiopian, and Eritrean Orthodox churches are among the oldest churches in the world, dating back to the 4th century AD. Today, there's a 
continuing spiritual hunger, as echoing the, the Ethiopian eunuch of Acts 8, many ask, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? Today, many Africans are still waiting and are working toward the day when they will have God's word in the language they understand best. End quote. This comes from this uh, Wycliffe Global Alliance website. The Bakwe were one of those languages. Lisa and I joined Wycliffe Bible Translators back in 1984 for the work of Bible translation. I was born and raised in Liberia, West Africa to missionary parents. My father was a Bible translator. I felt God had prepared me for this work in a, in a different way than many others, and I felt like I needed to go back to Africa. And uh, we decided to go to Cote d'Ivoire through God's leading and uh, confirmation a number of, other way, number of ways that I can go into uh, uh, later with you if you have that question. Cote d'Ivoire means Ivory Coast. It's on the west coast of Africa, about six degrees off of the equator. It's about the size of the state of Ohio and has 63 plus languages in it, broken up and d divided by uh, different geography in the country. There were still about a dozen languages that needed translation when we got back there, uh, when we started there in 1988. Most of, um, most of the larger languages missions went to first, the more large strategic languages, and then there's mo this is the mop-up of, of providing the rest of the country with scriptures in, their t in the mother tongue. Most of the Bakwe still, after a hundred years of French education, do not speak enough French to be able to understand the word read or preach to them on Sunday in French. The Bakwe live in the southwest Cote d'Ivoire between Soubre and San Pedro. Um, in Soubre uh, to the north, San Pedro uh, in the south on the coast, and the Sassandra River is on their east, and the Tai National Forest is on their west, and of course Liberia, the Liberian border there. The Bakwe was Language was not a written language yet when we arrived, so our first task was to begin living among them and learning their language so that we could develop an alphabet, analyze the sounds, and write these down with linguistic, the international phonetic alphabet, and then you do a phonology analysis, and you figure out which of those sounds are really key for an alphabet. And we got to that point and, and uh, did enough grammar analysis, and we began to make books, and including books for people to learn how to read and write. And then we could start reading and writing classes and train teachers with the goal, of course, not just to be educated, but to, to get the scriptures in the language and have a, developed a body of, of people that are able to use the scriptures and read them. The Bakwe, some information about them, the Bakwe are primarily agriculturalists, growing chocolate and coffee for cash crops and rice and manioc for staples. Though electricity and cell phones have come to the area in the last 10 years, many traditional customs remain just the same as they've always been, you know, as long as anyone can remember. Bakwe women still pound rice in a mortar and uh, fan it with their fanners to get out the chaff and then cook their rice and sauces on wood fires. The lady's talking on her cell phone there, you can see. Um, this, is a, this is a village that has maybe this is two, two, two flush toilets. When we, when we get, no flush toilets when we got there. We were the first, and then we got some, another one for our coworker. And, uh, but, but five cell phone companies that cover the area. I can chat online with my team over there um, on my phone. What are the Bakwe like? The Bakwe love to sing and make rhythm with all kinds of instruments. They're loud. The Bakwe are loud. The instruments are loud, too. And boy, can they dance. You know, talk about worship and dance. They, they've got that down from Scripture. You know, they, they've got the dance part down. Little old ladies like this um, could put all of you in this room to shame. Dancing is an important part of celebrating and expressing uh, their joy. I remember once taking an old man to who had a chronic, really bad sore in his foot taking him to get treatment in a clinic in a nearby town, and then bringing him back and having these Bakwe women rush up to me and grab me and start spitting over my shoulder. They spit over the shoulder to, to express your blessing, the person. And, uh, you know, it's, you want to wipe it off. But it, it's really going over the shoulder. And they'll grab your hand sometimes and spit on it too. And uh, that's a blessing. Um, but then they just start dancing. 
And it's not, look at me, I'm dancing. It's, it's joy that's just coming out, overflowing and coming out. And in church, if you come to a Bakwe service with us there, you'll see the church, they dance the offering up to the offering plate. And you, think, you might think, if I do that, I'm going to be thinking about myself the whole time I go up there to that offering plate. But the Bakwe aren't thinking about themselves at all. They're thinking about the joys coming out. If they can't move and dance, they feel like they're in a straight jacket. I've been told that by Pastor Fearman. He says, your Western worship, I, don't, I would just die if I was in that, you know, no outlet for the dancing. And, of course, their church choirs are no exception. This is our, part of our house in the background, our, our uh, porch for receiving people, and our kitchen there, and our, our sleeping part of the house is to the left. But the Harris Choir from a, church, a local church in town came and gave us a little concert to thank us for coming. Um, and they're no exception. They don't stand there and just move their mouth. They can't help it. They got to they dance. And like most Africans, the Bakwe love to wear bright colors. They, uh, this is coming out of church, always wearing bright colors. Literacy and literature, let's talk about that for a minute. As I said over the years, after learning the language and, and developing an alphabet for the Bakwe and beginning to produce materials for teaching and reading and writing, we began uh, te training teachers and starting reading and writing classes in different villages. The goal, of course, is to not just hand them a Bible and say, you're good now, but to develop a body of literature along parallel with the, the, the Bible, but getting people in the practice of reading and wanting to read so that when the scriptures are finally translated, they can read. Fearman and Perez, two of my colleagues, um, do all of the teacher training. Our vision is not to target uh, everybody, but to target church leaders specifically and uh, bring them up to speed in reading Bakwe so that they can read and teach the translated scriptures. We had, we had 11 at our first teacher training course, and we tried to hold at least two teacher training courses per year. Our goal, again, is not to educate everybody so that they can bow down to the God of education and have all their problems solved by education, but rather so that enough people in the Bakwe churches, primarily church leaders, can read the Bakwe scriptures that, are, that we are translating and raise a new generation of Bible-reading, God-fearing families. We had 26 teachers at our, uh, I guess this is the, one of our last uh, teacher training courses that I have pictures for. That every year we have new churches and new, uh, new villages that are asking us for reading and writing classes. We just don't have enough time to, to go out and, and, and train. We're trying to encourage this to be a grassroots thing so the teachers begin teaching other teachers so they're not always depending on us back at um, our central village. Besides translating the scriptures, we also publish other booklets folktale booklets, books on health, Bible background booklets, short stories written by our best students, some tracts, song booklets, and more. While Perez on the left and Fearman in the middle mostly work on literacy and ac literacy activities, Alexi on the right there and I work mainly on the translation. Translating takes a lot of time. We average about 12 to 15 verses a day, and you have to be extremely patient. We're grateful for all the people that help us. Uh, there's no way I could do this just with me and Alexi. We rely on, on Wycliffe Bible Translation consultants, translator consultants. Um, so I and Alex, I work on the exegesis of a pa passage. So I look at the Greek and the commentaries and you, my understanding of Bakwe, the grammar. I give it my best shot in Bakwe. And I write down, the. Um, if I'm not sure, I explain to to Alexi how this passage needs to be translated, how it needs to come across. Alexi then takes my attempt and makes it sound more natural, sends it back to me, and we go back and forth, and I again compare it to the Greek and make sure we haven't left anything out, and I ask questions. And when we're happy with that, then we sit down, we finished a book, and a Wycliffe translation consultant like Jonathan Burmeister here uh, checks over our work verse by verse. Jonathan is, is planning to work with us this January on my trip. We're going to have some scripture checked by him again. So far, we've finished Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Galatians, James, the epistles of John, 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians is, is in first draft. 
and I'm working on, uh, currently working on drafting Ephesians right now. Excuse me. Next year, our plan is to finish Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and First and Second Thess- Thessalonians. And Lord willing, we'll be able to finish the New Testament in the next four years and begin work on the Old Testament, Lord willing. Here's what the Gospel of John looks like. Now, we're publishing materials in two languages. We've got uh, Bakwe on the right and French on the left. The reason is there are some people that want to go on to French, so they got French right there. There's some people that that grew up in the city, and they're back in the village, and they don't know their language really well, so they have French, and they could go back the other way. There's fewer of those, but French is the language, the prestigious language in in Cote d'Ivoire because it was colonized by the French. But the problem is they've been trained that their language is, is a negative thing. And the pro- there's a difficulty, and so they have this negative uh, um, understanding of their own language identity. The problem is French is not them, and they'll never be French. So you, when people get enough French to understand French, they usually lose, or have lost their Bakwe culture. And they're not living in the village anymore anyway. They're not in the area. So there's a lot of people that never get on beyond to get that nice uh, level of French to be able to get a good job in the city. So you have this vast the majority of the people stay back in the village or flunk out, come back to the village, and then they can't be served by French. They just don't have enough of it to be able to be fed by it. So we're putting French there just as an incentive. Here's what... Um, John 3.16 sounds like in Bakwe. So you have there, John, high tones and low tones and mid tones and rising and falling tones, sort of like, like Chinese. Living among the Bakwe, as a family over the years, was an important part of our ministry. Um, we, seek, we sought not only to translate the scriptures, but also to live it out in biblical, live out biblical teaching and practical obedience to God's word. Living there as a family and not sending our kids to boarding school was an important part of our ministry. We felt like I grew up in Africa and, and, I, and I didn't see very many second generation, third generation Christians, even though missions had been in the country for 100, 100 plus years. And I think boarding school is one of those things that, that does, um, it, people don't, the, the Africans then don't see how a family is supposed to live, how they're supposed to live, to treat their children and love their children and react to their children and nurture their children. So we felt keeping our children there in the village was a really important part of our ministry. Lisa would often get comments from the ladies like, wow, and seeing how we interacted. Your husband, he really loves you just by watching us. You know, I didn't need to preach about it. They actually saw it in action. And they would say the same thing about the kids and how the kids responded to us and how we responded to the kids. My Bakwe colleagues would say to me, wow, your, your wife talks gently to you. Wives over there don't talk gently to their husbands. Usually they, if they're talking to them, they're scolding them or yelling at them. Besides preaching and teaching, Bible studies, and leading Bible studies, we helped start the first evangelical church in the village, and Pastor Firmen now pastors that church. Pastor Firmen is currently planting uh, three other churches in three other villages. Lisa homeschooled our children the whole time we were over there and ran the house, the garden, the plantation, the farm, and, and the farm and workers. And, and though it wasn't easy by a long shot to do all that and homeschool, uh, she wouldn't have traded it for anything else. We really enjoyed our years that we were able to live in the village as a family and, uh, and have Africans in our home and live there with them for them to watch us and see how, how we live. There's no eye playing mankala, you call it. Awali, awali is what they say in Cote d'Ivoire on the porch. Andreas, Jeremiah, no eye. Our monkey. You know, daily interaction with the Bakwe also included helping with their physical needs, health, medical, shelter, water, community development projects. We helped put in latrines. We were involved in, in um, various community development projects in the area. 
and certainly in health. A lot of uh, early on, I was doctoring, uh, doing first aid, treating every morning, treating wounds, changing band-aids. Uh, amazing, just first basic stuff that there's no clinic in our area when we first got there, no hospital nearby, so there's nothing. And they, w small wounds would develop into tropical ulcers, it would, it would develop into gangrene if you let it go too long. So uh, did a lot of that, and then uh, there was a medical clinic that came nearby, so I, I slowly got out of that. The Christ Church helped build the um, Bakwe Community Center slash Bible Translation Literacy Center. This We made every brick by hand and put up this uh, large building, which is serving us right now, our translation literacy offices. It serves as the village meeting place, so when officials come from the city to the, to the, um, the village, the chief takes them over to our conference room. And they're given a, a good chair to sit in. They set up the tables, and it's prestigious for the whole village. And we do our teacher training there, and, and churches uh, rent the building also for their, um, their vacation Bible school and that sort of thing. Over the years, we've had the blessing of having people from our church come out and visit us and help with the work. Prior to folks that have come out over the last half dozen years, back in 2001, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. We received a visit from Roy and Bev Atwood, and there's, Roy, there's Bev in there. I think Roy's taking the picture. They were sent by the elders of Christ Church with the purpose, the sole purpose of their visit being to check up on us and be an encouragement to us. And it was extremely encouraging uh, for that contact. It was wonderful. We did a lot of sitting around and fellowshipping, drinking tea and talking through things, and it was wonderful. Uh, and we ate a lot of spicy food together. Here the Bakwe uh, team put on a meal for us, and, and uh, we had ate together here in, this, in the Bakwe uh, conference room, which was still under construction at that time. Wes Struble, who's here, came out with me um, once to make repairs on our house and, and uh, sort of lock it up when uh, the country had, there was a lull in the Civil War, and I, we had left the country on a six-month furlough thinking that we'd be back in six months, so we didn't pack away our stuff. And uh, all of a sudden, we're two years out, and the house is just, books are out in the open for mice to chew and that sort of thing. So Wes agreed to come in with me. We went in, and we, we boarded up the books in there, put um, chunks, of, chunks of tobacco throughout the bookshelves to, as an insecticide and some insecticide powder, and then boarded up all the books on the bookshelves and uh, kind of repaired uh, screens in the window. And Wes was able to do all that. I didn't want to be able to come back and just spend all my time working with my stuff, you know. So having Wes there to do that, I could just visit with people and hear their stories about the suffering that they had been through. So it was a real wonderful uh, chance for, for me to do that and have someone from the church come out. And over the last several years, Shell Christofferson has come out with me several times to teach seminars for micro-entrepreneurs. Shell has a lot of experience in West Africa with the World Bank, speaks French fluently, and so he's done a tremendous work with us um, training our, particularly our literacy teachers. Our teachers that we've trained were selected, those that, to come to a business seminar, and then we started a seed fund, and, and the seed fund exists to take a loan out of if you have a viable business, small business thing, a $200 business that you want to start. Some, and the largest loans we've given out are a $1,000 a business plan. And most of these people, that's huge. $200, you know, $200 capital to start my little restaurant business of selling a plate of rice and, being, and some kind of topping. You know, that becomes extra income. Just a little bit of income there is huge for them. In 2008 and 2009, Benjamin Nusma and Scott Hieronymus came out with me. Benjamin followed up Dr. Christofferson's teaching with a second seminar on starting up and running a small business. Benjamin studied French at the U of I, and with the French that he had studied at the U of I, he was able to um, use it there. Africans are not worried about pronunciation of French and le and la, you know, the feminine and masculine. Communication is the main thing, and Benjamin got a 200% communication out of the little French that he had, and they just patiently took it, and uh, of course we had it translated also into, into Bakwe and had it written out ahead of time, so 
so we could prepare the Bakwe translator. Scott helped us with our computers and installed a solar power backup power system. Scott and Benjamin worked together on that as well. And Scott didn't have any French. He just had, hello, goodbye, you know, I'm hungry, that sort of thing. But, uh, um, you know, a smile and love and serving somebody goes a long way to communicate the love of Christ, even without French. So it was wonderful to have them there. There's a solar panel array that they set up. And you know, that thing's still working now. This is, what, three years? And we've got a, ba a power backup system that we had time. At, right after they set that up, we went through a, a time where they're rationing electricity all around the country. And we went where we could keep working. Translation could carry on. Benjamin also trained my Bakwe team how to use some new recording gear that we brought out. And Benjamin and Scott's help enabled me again, like when Wes came out, to spend time with people. Under Pastor Fearman's leadership, the church we helped start is growing and using the scriptures, that the, what we have translated so far. But probably the highlight of every trip that I take out is hearing another story about someone whose life has been transformed and changed by the scriptures. And I'll wrap it up with this. You've heard this story before, but this old lady, I never really expected older ladies to, to actually learn how to read, particularly if they never had any exposure to reading and writing in French. Um, I was on my porch in the evening, and, and Perez, one of our teachers, brought this old lady by. She happens to be the, the, the wife of a chief of another village, way to the north of us, slightly different dialect from the dialect that we're working in brought her to, to show off her reading skills to me. And this happens a lot. And sometimes people that have learned to read that are older, they're just memorizing stuff that they've seen on a page. They see the picture, and they've got the text memorized. And I thought to myself, oh boy, here it goes. I'm going to have to encourage her, even though she's got this memorized, and she's showing off. So she, um, she began, re uh, opened up the ABCs, A for apple, B for ball, you know, that kind of a thing. Of course, they don't have apples over there, so we had the appropriate thing for A. She read that through, and, and I was like, yeah, good job, good job. And then she turns to the end of the primer and uh, reads the more complicated folktale, one of their own folktales like Little Red Riding Hood that's in there. And, uh, you know, that equivalent, everybody knows it. So I thought to myself, Meh, maybe she's memorized that as well. And uh, I thought, wow, good job. And I was ready. She closed the primer and was going to put it back in her purse, and then I know she was fumbling in the purse for something else. So I kind of held off a little bit because I was going to say, good job, you know, I encourage her to keep on learning. And she pulls out the Gospel of John. And I could tell right there the pages were dovetailed and, and dirty. Uh, tops and the bottoms of the corners were all, all, you know, tattered. And she opened that thing up somewhere in it and just started reading fluently. And I knew that she hadn't memorized that. And she closed that and I was in tears. And I thought to myself, you know, this... This is so encouraging. And she, she went, she started telling me, you know, thank you so much for coming because my pastor doesn't preach on this. He preaches about tithing. He preaches about, you know, mostly it's tithing. And, and I don't, all that's in here is, not, you're laughing, but it's true. The passages that really serve the pastor and, and um, often are preached on and the things that teaching the whole counsel of God is a foreign thing for a lot of churches. She hadn't heard all the stories and the miracles of Jesus, but now she had seen it all because she read it for herself. And she could be fed when on Sundays they're preaching in French and she's not understanding. She can open her Bible to the passage, her portion of scripture to the passage and read it in her own language. In Malachi 1.11, the Lord says, From the rising of the sun even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name. For my name shall be great among the nations. 2,000 years ago at Pentecost, the great reversal of Babel took place. God equipped his church to fulfill the cultural mandate, to multiply and fill the earth, to make a name for God among the nations. Rather than unifying people around one language, God speaks every language of the world, and he unifies every tribe, every tongue, every nation through the gospel of grace. It seems more likely than ever that in our generation we will see a translation of the Bible begun in every remaining language that needs it. And I believe that when translations are finished, we're going to see God raise up 
the Whitfields, the Spurgeons of Africa and Asia to preach the word of God in unveiled words, in unshrouded truth. And we're going to see a huge progress in advance of the church across the face of the earth. You can be a part of that, of that happening, either by sending, as you are already, sending missionaries out, by supporting the work of Bible translation, or by going out yourself. Thank you.